you all doing? I'm Ricardo, the cynical critic, your host of Ruby Reviews, and what a week it's been! I'll say, not only did I have a couple new shows to catch up on, but I also had three new bodies to bury, some unwilling lollies to loot, noobs to teabag, some teabags to poison, a political assassination to execute, a celebrity to ruin, some dumbass to avoid, and above all that, at a frickin' doctor's appointment yesterday. I was just gonna say that school has been a pain! What the doc say? Nah, I'm a little underweight, but he said my electrolytes were great. Okay, well, anyways, welcome back, guys. We got another episode, and if it's anything like last time, we're in for another good one. So let's take a look at what happened last time to remind us that the show is still somewhat fun to watch. Well, last time, we got to be part of the funnest event that anyone could have asked for. Family conflict. Yeah, after a little, if you don't stop being a douchebag stereotype, I'm going to turn this bike around and beat the ever living Looney Tunes out of you again. Yang finally reaches her deadbeat mom. However, it turns out that Raven doesn't seem to be on the same page as Yang, thinking instead that she has finally come home. But Goldilocks isn't there for some quality time with her mommy, much to my disappointment, but is instead there because Raven's semblance can teleport her directly to Ruby, saving her the trip. Cat's prices, man, it's ridiculous. So, like the entitled team she is, Yang demands her mom to do all the work. And after a little scuffle where Yellow reunites with Snow, Raven concedes. Meanwhile in Mistral, the gang continues to try to whip Oscar into shape. And it doesn't seem like he's the only one that needs it. However, this scene is short both because Ren won't shut up and because the writers don't like us. And others that don't like people would be the oppressive Belladonnas, as a lizard lesbian explains that all the white thing want to do is just exterminate the human race and defile their corpses. Is that too much to ask? So the race traders better watch their Bella backs, cause it looks like it's gonna be open season on the cats. And with that done, let's start the review. Lakana, roll the clip. Incidentally, this was the episode where the new intro was spoiled for me. Thank you ECC Anime Club for not playing anything else and forcing me to leave the room and nearly $30 of merch I was going to sell you and then stealing said merch. You guys were great. Well, we're back in paradise as Blake and Sun head out to get the people to sign their petition. However, it doesn't seem like anybody wants the Black Sun to become canon, cause try as hard as they can, no one seems interested in signing. Sun can't understand why the Faunus aren't willing to protect Mistral, but Blake explains that the people of Menagerie came here to get away from conflict. If Adam gets his way and Haven falls, it's only going to make things worse for the Faunus. Everywhere. Have you ever met someone and thought to yourself, they are the personification of this word? No, because that's stupid. Well, the bookworm explains that when she first met her team, she thought Ruby embodied the word purity, wise defiance, and Yang as senpai. No, strength. A strong senpai. What am I? Jerry's still out on that one. Mainly because the bubble beers won't let us have an opinion. Because you don't get one. But I'm leaning towards Ernest. <laughs> Blake continues saying that for Adam she thought he was justice or passion, but soon realized that he was simply spite, as his hate for the humans would not allow him to see them as equals, believing that they all should suffer for what a few did. And his way of life is contagious, as seen with Ilya. Though she started out as a kind soul, slowly that faded. And Blake too once traveled the same path. My parents tried to get me to leave with them, but I refused. I had Adam and Ilya after all. You know we're going to have to face her eventually. I know. So, what are you gonna do? I'm going to try and help her the way you helped me. Hmm? I did not like the way his tail stood up. Neither did I. But I do like what this means for Blake and Ilya. So you no longer ship the Bumblebee? No, just expanding it to Bumble Illa. Even though she was running in guilt and wanted to be alone, Sun never gave up on her. And because of that, she won't give up on Ilya. It's about time I saved my friends for once. We then cut to Ruby coming to tell a training Oscar that the food's ready. She compliments his skill for someone so new to it. But at this pace, you'll be combat ready in no time. We just need to get you a combat skirt. Crows already have his. Ren's got those little flappy things. And John? John's girly enough as it is. Well, I'll see you upstairs. How do you handle all of this? I'm scared. 
and more scared than I've ever been in my life. I always knew that I wanted to be more than a farmhand, but this? You're right. None of us asked for this either. We just have to press on and- How can you be so confident? People have tried to kill you. The world's about to go to war all over again. How are you okay with any of this? Ruby explains that he isn't alone. When the school fell, she lost two of her friends. And while she didn't really know them long, they were some of the kindest spirits she had ever encountered. Pyrrha gave her life trying to stop the one responsible, and Penny died trying to figure out how magnets work. But that is why they need to take a stand, why they need to do something. For while she is terrified too, she is more scared of losing others because she did nothing. So that's what I choose to do. To keep moving forward. Come on. If we don't hurry, Nora's gonna eat everything. Yeah, it wouldn't be the first, the first time. time. Jinx! You owe me a cookie! Hey, Oscar. This isn't gonna be easy, but the fact that you're even trying says a lot about you. You're braver than you think. She really is remarkable, isn't she? Yeah, that ass is indeed a work of art. Speaking about people's asses, we then cut to the doggo duo, scheming as Ilya walks in. They inform her that Sienna has been overthrown by Adam, and she takes the murder of their former leader very well. However, she falters for a second when told that the Belladonnas will have to be dealt with in a similar manner. But she gets over this as well when she hears that Adam wants Blake alive. I'm guessing that she's hoping that she'll be rewarded with a new pet. I certainly want to be. Dear Santa. I have been very good this year, and all I want for Christmas is a Nico of my very own. And some anti would be nice too. After the ninja leaves, the two rewatch the hollow recording of Adam whining again, complaining about his ex. God, dude, just move on. Are we sure he is the one to lead us? For now. It is the will of the dynamic doofuses. Just then, another enters, informing that Gear's messenger took a little swim with the fishies. You do realize that some furnaces can live in the water. <laughs> Not this one. Then all is well. Ooh, an ominous ending. That's not cliched. Well, cliched or not, this episode was great, both in character and in world building. But it was tainted by one of the main problems of this volume. And yes, it was the problem that I told you was not likely to get any better. Your face? No! Oh, well, uh, never mind then. Yes, while the character interactions and building upon their history and relationships has been getting better and better with striking moments of emotion and slivers of personal growth, the main issue seems to have gotten worse. While the world and cultural enrichment of Remnant has shown in the background without outshining our cast, sadly the concern of this season shows no sign that it will be changed from the path that it has taken. And our main problem is... Adam's personality. Or more accurately, personality of the villains. Since the first season, the audience and critics alike have complained that the Ruby writers did not know what they were doing with the villains, nor how they were to make them the big baddies that our girls would have to face. True, we've gotten some entertaining kind like Roman and his kid, some interesting ones like Cinder and Emerald, and even an intimidating figure like Salem, but since their attack in season 3, none but one have managed to take in the spot of threatening. That was supposed to be different when it came to the White Fang. From their introduction in Volume 1, they were just placed as the simple goons. But as the show went on, their importance got more and more potent, culminating in the last scene's declaration from Blake that they would finally get to be an important baddie. However, all that hinged on their leaders and the personalities they portrayed. Only Sienna so far exhibited a sense of leadership and strength, and we all saw how that went. So Adam and the Foxy Bros needed to share a similar presence. But while Mize and Carrie seem to be going for the easily dislikable villains, they're doing too good of a job. Didn't I tell you guys that nothing pleases him? Even when they do do a good job, he still complains. The issue with an easy to hate bad guy is that it leaves no room for history or sympathy. Which is fine if you just want a means to fear, like the Fire Lord or Colonel Muska, or a means to an end, like Father Canelio or 
insert any studio trick villain here, but not when you're trying to set up an emotionally conflicting battle like this one. And the easily hateable villain is the lazy man's crutch to getting the audience to dislike them and trust me, you didn't need to go that route to make Adam any more unlikable than he already is. Plus, making them so cartoonishly evil usually just makes them boring and forgettable. And Tanya, after we're done eating babies and drinking orphan tears, we should go seal club it. I'm sorry, what were you saying? The saying, I hated the bad guys and therefore I love them, works only if we're talking subjectively. But objectively, it doesn't mean squat. Plus, Adam coming across more as a whiny brat than a cold, intimidating force leaves a bigger problem in its wake by making the white thing a joke. This ruins any and all redemptive properties for the group as it quickly means that we can guess what's going to happen next. Adam will likely become so selfish in his own goals that he'll be abandoned by his followers, or that he'll do something so incredibly stupidly evil that even the audience won't be able to get behind him, leading to him likely easily being defeated, which takes glory away from anything that Blake could have done. At least with Corsic and Fennec, they have some sort of conniving sensibility to their personality, but it too is marred by the overly evil tone that we too can sort of see their fate. What would have made these issues go away was to do something like making Adam indeed truly loyal to his people, calmly spoken and intelligent, while still unyielding towards his hate for humans, and the brothers still being devious but being more subtle with their intent. However, the one saving grace to all of that is Ilya. The lesbian is always the saving grace in anime. Though it's clear on how things are going to turn out for her as well, we are still drawn in by her confliction and hesitations. It makes her into a truly interesting character, seeing which side will win, and more importantly, seeing her character grow as she makes these hard choices. Again, a fusion of her character into Adam's personality would have been a better choice, cause we cannot get behind the things she does, but we understand and empathize with her pain. Because while the dynamic doofuses have always had a hard time dealing with their antagonists, they have more than excelled with their main characters and main cast members. And speaking of which, I have a feeling that many of the Ruby haters, the character, not the show, have been talking out of their asses. Well, that is why they call them buttheads. Because we get another great scene with a little Rose interacting with someone that needs her help. Seeing Ruby come alongside another soul and encouraging them in such an innocent and hope-filled way that only a pure spirit like Ruby can is both adorable and inspiring. Before she had no one to be by her side to help her to become a leader or hero, and yet she's still burning the responsibility all the same. However, that has never stopped her from doing it for others. And the boy certainly needs it, as we finally get what we needed in the previous season, when first introduced to the lad. At first, it was difficult to sympathize with Oscar's troubles, as we didn't know enough about him, and one of the ways that could have fixed that was if he was given more screen time, and more importantly, more lines. However, unlike last time where he got maybe a few dozen lines that really didn't convey his emotional state, here we get a well executed scene of fright from the farm boy. First was the previous episode where it was clear through his body language and his tone that he was very uncertain of his role in all this and was extremely uncomfortable in playing it. And that built up to here where all that pent up worry comes out on the one person that can help him. Aaron Dismuke has done some work in the past, one of them that I will continue to praise, but here it is taken to a whole new level with Oscar. He manages to convey to us just what a young boy would be feeling if he suddenly found a voice in his head telling him that the world may end if he doesn't do something. And while I wouldn't say that she's managed to reach his level, Lindsay Jones has certainly come a long way as well since her debut in the Yellow trailer. Yang? Is that you? What are you doing? A very long way. But this scene here shows us that it was all worth it. And who knows what future these two have. None. The White Rose is too strong. I meant in regards to more character interactions. My statement still stands. Anyways, the other interaction that actually is a relationship was just as good as well. Because while it went on, we got some nice world building in the background. I'm not really gonna get into the whole the Yang and Blake relationship is practically non-existent in this review, as I'll save that for another time. Unable to think of a legitimate argument against the B, I see. For now, I'm just gonna talk about this relationship. God damn it. As we do get a great moment between these two. 
nothing really romantic, which is what we need as this scene is more about building their connection and shared goal of reclaiming the white thing. And while that's being sabotaged in other areas, through their discussion about it, we get to see both Sun's loyalty and Blake's growth. It is interesting that she did say that to her, he seemed to embody the word earnest, as he is indeed committed to both her and her cause. It goes to show how far and deep this relationship runs, but I did say that I wasn't going to talk about the shipping wars though that's sort of easy as I don't care. But what isn't easy to ignore is Blake's growth as a character. Before, many thought that she was just a token cat girl stand-in for a racial message. But Belladonna has certainly taken her life into her own hands. Through her discussion, we can see her history involving the White Fang, treatment by the humans, her family, and the decisions she's made. And while, again, Miles and Sonic kind of drop the ball with how she describes Adam, at least they built her character as a damaged but redeemed figure of what hate can do to oneself. Also, I'd just like to make a little interesting note here. Is it just me? Or does it seem like the Ruby community is mirroring the Faunus and the White Fang in terms of how their members are acting? Well, some of those idiots do wear cat ears. Anyway, this is all a great scene that is slowly building Blake to be the leader that she needs to be. All the while, we get some nice world building too. I've mentioned before that it's still a little confusing on exactly what the rules are when it comes to the Faunus and their traits. Still doesn't count. But seeing all the diverse attributes that they have subtly builds to the lore of this world. And that's not even going into their home of Menagerie. A simpler world that still engages with technology works on the history of this land, as well as setting up some interesting interesting questions. Where did they all come from? How did they build this place? Why, if they are so physically better than humans, are they here? What is the relationship they have with each other here? How do their traits transfer from generation to generation? Still doesn't count. All these questions and more helps build to the intrigue of this world while not needing to be answered. And let's hope that is never directly answered because it is best to leave mysteries like this in your story. Except for that last one. I, for one, would like to see a documentary on the, uh, mating rituals of these cat girls. But as for now, this was another interesting episode that manages to still shine even with a few flaws. In fact, so far Volume 5 has been doing a whole lot better than Volume 4. Now that could simply be because since this season got so much hate, when looking at it critically and failing to find the issues that we were told, things seem to look a lot better than they really are. But even Volume 3 didn't have this great of a start, and that was the first one to have substantial plot. Maybe Miles and Carrie are getting better at storytelling. Or maybe this is just only the high before everything goes downhill. Well, I'd like to be an optimistic realist. While indeed I am cynically going to say that I don't trust miles per hour to keep it up, I do hope that they do, and that the hate that this volume got was just from those critics. You know the ones, the ones who are just looking for a show to hate on so they can get some views. Because they are, you know, stupid. And a pox on them all! Luxor, Noxor, Burst and Burn! the hell are you doing? Just a curse. Have a nice day. I guess we'll all just have to keep moving forward with this show to find out. So until next week guys, thanks for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this and hit subscribe and the bell icon to be notified of future videos. Don't forget to share this and leave a comment telling me what you thought. I'm Ricardo, the cynical critic. With me, no movies sacred, no videos saved, but all deserve a chance. I'll catch you guys next time. Toodles! Time has come. Execute Order 66. As you command, sir. Maniacal lad. <laughs> Maniacal lad. <laughs> Maniacal lad. <laughs> Maniacal lad. <laughs> hey! 
Do you have any idea what time it is? Shut up!